I'm Steve Cheney, the CEO of the American Security Project. Welcome to our second major event of the week. We had Undersecretary Stengel here on Monday uh, talking public diplomacy, and one of his predecessors, Farah Sonnenschein, is here to, today. We're going to talk Middle East, the Middle East politics, and the future of America in the Middle East. That's not a very broad topic these days, I recognize. Uh, but we've got a very distinguished panel here uh, with such a broad, diverse background. It's a little different than your normal, uh, I think, think tank folks that are going to be on a, on a panel like this. We have people with a lot of varied experience. They understand it. They've been there. We're going to try to tailor this down. No, Fadi, you're going to you know, kind of moderate it for us and narrow this topic down just a little bit. I know everybody's been following what's going on in the news. Um, it's almost minute by minute. I was just watching uh, Secretary uh, Hagel and his House Armed Services maybe testimony was who watched Kerry yesterday. Uh, Senator Kerry and Hagel both founded this organization. And uh, there were a number of basic principles behind it, not the least of which was climate change, energy security, nuclear security, asymmetric operations, and terrorism, which is, of course, what we're going to talk today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Fadi and let you uh, introduce and rock and roll. We'll cut this off. In turn, you got to leave a little early, as I understand it. So we're going to probably cut it off about 120 or 125. So Fadi, it's yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fadio Salamin. I'm with YCF. Uh, it's a small private equity and venture capital firm here in DC. As you heard, the topic today is about the uh, future of the Middle East and America's role uh, in that part of the world. Much of what has been discussed in the public arena lately has been about the military uh, role in inviting ISIS. Um, unfortunately, there's little talk about uh, what else can be done aside from the military uh, role? Uh, you have uh, the Middle East is obviously three, you know, the, the Arab population. Let's just say that is a, it's a majority of, of the population are young people. They are unemployed. In, uh, unemployed. Uh, the last uh, statistic that was floating around by the World Bank is that the Arab world has to generate about 100 million jobs by 2020 just to keep unemployment at the same level as it is at today. So with that being in mind, is, milit is the military solution the only solution to fighting ISIS? You have other pro problems going on. You have young, unemployed, uh, poor people who are not being uh, included in the governance process, they're not being included in the, uh, the economic process. It's extremely difficult to incorporate a company if you're a young entrepreneur. There, there are many, 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 many sides to this issue. It's not just the military, uh, the military side. That's why we have a distinguished uh, panel today. We have uh, Ms. Sunshine. She was the uh, former Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. She's currently teaching at George Washington University. We have Shadi Hamid, he's a fellow at Brookings Institution's uh, Center for Middle East Policy. He has a great book, which I, I hope you will all uh, read. It's called Temptation of, Temptations of Power, Islamists, and Illiberal Democracy in the Middle East. Uh, and we have uh, Paul Hamill, is the CEO at the American Security Project. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sunshine, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, and firstly, I want to thank the American Security Project. I mean, how many places can you get a bipartisan conversation in which you pause from the day-to-day -day chaos of an issue to really reflect? And so I ask you to join me in a round of applause for right, thank you. ASP. Thank you. Now, I know I'm, I'm on the body <coughs> shoddy. <laughs> so um, I'm going to speak very briefly because I know my colleagues here have, have a lot to say. But I do want to reflect on the people of this region. And I know it's right now we are focused on bombs and bullets, but I'm also focused on blogs and what real ordinary citizens in this region are thinking. And I want to begin by asking us if we can go back a little bit as to how we got here. And just to spend at least a moment, um, history is uh, a lost art in some ways in a new cycle, but 
I do think we got here in part because of what people in the region were saying and doing and what governments in the region were saying and doing. And I'm, I'm not naive. I understand that governments matter, but I also believe deeply that citizens matter. Um, certainly the absence of strong government in Iraq, the presence of a bad government in Syria, all of that part of the problem. But I do hope we can look back at what was a profound and dramatic wave of change that swept across this broad swath that we call the Middle East. Let's recall the uprisings that began with a revolution in Tunisia that forced other governments and individuals to face up to the call for accountability, freedom, and opportunity. And it was not too long ago that we had an Arab spring, an Arab fall, an Arab winter, and many seasons of discontent. But we did have moments to celebrate and at least to mark progress. It was not too long ago we were talking about the unlocking of the potential of women and girls. We were talking about rule of law. We were talking about the potential for entrepreneurship in the region. It was a time when we all felt very hopeful. Hopeful about Malala's. Hopeful about Afghan women. Hopeful about Nobel Peace Prizes to peace builders. So what happened? How did we end up with ISIS or ISIL, a broken Iraq, a damaged Syria, a dysfunctional <coughs> Libya, an unclear Egypt, and a breakdown in peace processes between Israelis and Palestinians. And of course, what you all came to hear, where do we go from here? Firstly, I am not ready to write off all the reformers and voices of reason in this region. I am willing today to publicly say where I think we have let them down. We did not really pay enough attention to those voices calling for peaceful change, ultimately voices drowned out by extremists. I think our sin, if we have a sin in this, is the sin of impatience. Revolutions are revolutions. They are not evolutions. Transitions take time. We in this country have grown so increasingly impatient, along with other citizens, for change, results, and improvements. We in this country, we want the cash from the cash machine now. We don't really wait for much. And so I think we grew a little impatient ourselves with change. I don't think we gave the Iranian revolution a full chance to succeed. I don't think we gave enough support when scholars and ordinary citizens in that country were writing freedom slogans on the back of money. I don't think we listened closely enough to what ordinary Egyptians were telling us about the Muslim Brotherhood, and we'll probably disagree on that piece of the puzzle. And I don't think we fully responded to the call when Syrian citizens said we're tired of the regime under which we live and labor. I'm also prepared to say that not all of this is America's fault. I actually understand what President Obama was trying to say when he said that information and media contribute. I think it came out sounding like a complaint about the press instead of a recognition that the information revolution has been transpiring along with these other revolutions. And so I think we've seen the videos and the chaos in the information side. I guess where I come down for today's conversation is that we have to now get back to our lodestars.
what is it we in the United States believe in? We believe in support for transitions to democracy. We believe in planting the seeds and the habits of democracy. We believe in the promotion of individual freedom, civil society, tolerance, pluralism, diversity, rule of law, religious freedom, freedom of expression, speech, and media. And I believe it's time we talk about those things just as much as we talk about strikes, targets, because at the end of the long string of the story of the Middle East, you will find individuals, people who want basic things, a job, security, an income, a voice, and the absence of tyranny. Can we not go back to the values and interests in security, prosperity, peaceful transitions before we are fully lost in the fog of terrorism and war. I may sound a bit optimistic and <coughs> rosy at a time when rosy is not the color of the day. But I think there is still something about American exceptionalism, about moral suasion, and about the American dream upon which we have proceeded. So from my end, I simply refuse to give up hope. And I look forward to interacting with all of you and hearing from the political security geo macro view. But I'm sticking with citizens for today. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Fatty, Paul, and the American Security Project for having me. Just to give all you guys a heads up, I'm going to be uh, less optimistic just to prepare you. So I was, I was. With all the hype leading up to Obama's uh, address on ISIS, I was a little bit nervous because this was really, in some ways, our last chance to fundamentally reorient our policy. And Obama has been trying to run away from the Middle East for the last several <coughs> years. Here, here he was being forced to reconsider, or so we hoped. Um, I had a feeling I'd be disappointed, and I was right. I was disappointed. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't totally a surprise. Obama had given us a sense of his strategy during his remarks at the NATO summit, but he doubled down on that. And what we have essentially is a fairly narrow counterterrorism strategy, a kind of glorified war on terror on what is not primarily a terrorist organization. And to see Obama describe ISIS as a terrorist organization, quote unquote, pure and simple, with no vision beyond the, the killing of innocents and the people who disagree with them. Yes, ISIS is evil, brutal, and all of that, but it is much more than your traditional terrorist organization. That's precisely why we should be frightened. That's precisely why this is a different kind of threat, and a threat that requires a more serious, coherent, long-term response. So ISIS, in addition to a terrorist organization, is a proto-state. Unlike previous terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, it has serious aspirations to governance. It cares about holding territory. It runs local administrations. It provides some degree of law and order. Um, and in a very chaotic situation, such as in Syria, that does actually hold some appeal to ordinary citizens. That's not to say that anything close to a majority of Syrians or Iraqis agree with ISIS's vision, but in many cases, they're better than the alternative of, of chaos or the total lack of governance. So <clears throat> if ISIS is more than your normal terrorist organization, then we shouldn't be using a narrow counterterrorism strategy. And that's where I think there's a real gap between means and ends. If, in fact, the ends are to degrade and destroy ISIS, I don't think our means quite match that. Now, when I was kind of thinking about Obama's address um, after initially watching it, uh, I, did a, I, I, I didn't remember hearing the word democracy. But I wanted to make sure, so I did a little control F thing. And uh, in fact, he hadn't mentioned the word democracy as it relates to the Middle East. 
And this was another very troubling component. And this is where I, I do agree with, with my colleague Terry here, is that we have to look beyond the narrow military aspects. And there was no broader vision talking about the role of democracy and democracy promotion in the Middle East. But why is that important, you might ask? Well, if we acknowledge that the failure of democratic processes after, during and after the Arab Spring and the general failure of governance of the past few years is one of the contributing factors to extremism, then it does become very important. And that's where it becomes critical to look at some of the root causes of extremism and terrorism. And there's a whole there's an academic literature on the relationship between lack of democracy and the resort to political violence and extremism. Um, it is generally considered not people can debate whether it's the main factor, but it's certainly one factor among many, and we can't lose sight of that. <clears throat> This is a spread. This this um, this hole in our strategy is particularly concerning because we're allying with very problematic allies in the fight against ISIS. We're allying with some of the most repressive regimes in the region, um, and you could name them. Two of them, obviously, are Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And so you have to kind of, you know. So we have a little bit of a problem here that if extremism, sorry, if, if the lack of democracy is one of the root causes of terrorism, and then we're going here and allying with autocratic regimes, there, there's a little bit of a problem. Now, um, so we kind of have this, uh, and already I should say, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and others are using the guise of this new war on terrorism to attack their domestic opponents at home. So for them, this is a very opportune moment to kind of lump in together all of, the, all of their uh, domestic opponents, whether they're extremists or not, and say, well, we have an ISIS problem at home. And that's precisely what Egyptian officials have been saying for the past couple weeks. And this is, and then we can kind of bring into the discussion the role of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and mainstream Islamists, and Tara mentioned this briefly, but it's worth mentioning that ISIS gained a lot of ground in their narrative with the Egyptian coup of last year on July 3rd, 2013, because essentially what ISIS is arguing is that the gradualist model of the Muslim Brotherhood and like-minded Islamist movements is a failure. That the Islamic State can't be achieved through the democratic process, through elections, but only through the force of arms. And that's precisely what they've been saying over the past year and a half. That group violence and terror is what can create and impose the Islamic State right now. And that's where it becomes very important to, to distinguish between different kinds of Islamist groups. And I'm worried that there's a, there's a kind of trend that some of you may have noticed over the past week or so. There's been a, a slew of op-eds, including one in the New York Times, I won't mention who was written by Dennis Ross, that, um, that I thought was very problematic in this respect. Now, as I just kind of close up here, we, we find ourselves in this kind of endless loop. So um, autocratic regimes contribute to a context of instability and extremism, but then we need those same autocratic regimes to fight the extremism. So it's this kind of um, we're kind of stuck in that way. Um, and, and I do acknowledge that we, we live in the real world. We do have to work with autocratic allies who we don't share values, don't share the same values with. But that's the short term. But we have to be thinking about once we kind of move beyond this one to two, three year period of this, this narrow counterterrorism approach, how do we look more broadly at the future of the Middle East and America's role in it? And I worry that we're kind of going to get stuck again and again in this kind of arsonist, uh, as Tom Friedman put it in one of his <coughs> columns, the arsonist and the fireman, that the people who um, set the fires or fuel the fires are then the ones who try to put out the fires. And um, now, and then just to, just to close up, I'll say, um, I have doubts about whether the US is going to be able to do the things that I would like it to do. And when I was a kind of naive graduate student back in the day, I used to think that just, you know, 
if those of us in the academic or think tank community just get a chance to share the on the ground analysis and information with policymakers, then they'll kind of see the light. The best ideas will naturally rise to the top. I no longer believe in that. They, we, we meet with our counterparts at state defense at the NSC on a regular basis. They do know that they do know the information. Um, it's, not, it's not as if they have to be informed. It's a bigger problem of whether <coughs> our national security architecture, our, fo our foreign policy making process is capable of reassessing and rethinking and fundamentally shifting its approach. And we should have learned that over the course of the 2000s with the war on terror that we'd be able to kind of rethink how we approach some of these things. But is the U.S. capable of changing its foreign policy, distancing itself from some of its problematic autocratic allies, and prioritizing, or I should say reprioritizing, the role of democracy and democracy promotion in U.S. foreign policy? I don't know. I don't know if we're capable of doing that. It does require political will and leadership, and that's very much lacking, I think, in this particular administration, to the extent that we totally push to the side even the mere mention, the language of democracy and democracy promotion. Um, so I'll just kind of, I guess, leave you on that uh, <coughs> pessimistic note, but I'm sure we'll talk about that, talk about some of these issues more. Thank you. Hopefully, Tao will be able to answer. How do you square that circle? Thank you. Um, <coughs> the whole situation reminds me of a, a great Lyndon Johnson quote from, from the early 60s who said, I want to divorce my first wife of Europe, uh, marry my second wife of Asia, but my mistress, the Middle East, won't let me alone. Um, I think what we've seen in our discussion today is the need for a balance between the immediate and the strategic. And the immediate is not helpful for the strategic, and the strategic is not helpful for the immediate. Uh, and that's going to be a discussion that needs to take place both in the Arab world and in the US and Western capitals on what should that balance be like. Um, and if we take forward the immediate crisis we have right now, um, we need to help the, uh, and be enablers uh, for the Arab countries to solve their own immediate security problems. We, we keep talking about not, let's not have boots on the ground. Well, actually, we do need boots on the ground. It doesn't need to be the U.S.'s boots on the ground. It needs to be our boots on the ground. And we need to think about the ideas that people have raised about creating uh, an Arab-style NATO that can share resources and that can share security. But then that has to be balanced with this strategic need of, we've called it democratization. But in reality, it is what I think Fadi raised earlier, a governance process. We, I think for too long in the US, we've been caught up with democracy being an election. And it, and it really is just the one election we're concerned about. Um, you know, one of the greatest of our founding fathers here uh, was not really George Washington. It, it was John Adams, because he lost an election and left. And there wasn't sort of tanks and, uh, although there wasn't tanks, <laughs> but there wasn't troops on the street trying to force him out. He just packed his bags and left. Um, and, and so it's really the second, third, fourth elections that are important. So it is this governance process. Um, and we shouldn't be rushing into it. Um, America needs to understand more and needs to learn more uh, to take that forward. And then it's not just about democracy or this governance process. We've got to look at trade and economics. Uh, as Fadi said, 100 million jobs. That, that's not going to be easy to create. Um, you know, we, don't, we only have one free trade agreement with, with Africa, as an example, with Morocco. Uh, you know, this is 2014, we only have one free trade agreement. Uh, we need to move forward on this sort of stuff. Uh, and, and then obviously key is education. There's a whole lack uh, of, of, uh, of education throughout the region that needs to be brought forward in conjunction with trade, economics, and this governance process. Thank you for Just 
if you don't mind answering what, what Shadi said, but to, just to add on that, don't forget that gold is not a poor uh, part of the world. There's a lot of money in that part of the world. A lot of it is leaving, uh, and not much is staying there. So if you are young, uh, you know, young Arab or young Muslim sitting in that part of the world, you know everybody around you has money, you're unemployed, you're smart, you're educated, you're a graduate of a good college, but you can't get a job. Well, I do want to hear from all of you, but let me respond to a few things that I heard um, from my colleague, and I, I agree with a lot of it, I disagree with some of it, <coughs> mostly on the, the president. This president is often faulted for being too nuanced, too careful, too cautious, not calling things out. So I always um, find myself feeling a bit for him when he calls something out and says, this is a terrorist organization. And people come forth and say, oh, he's not being broad enough. Or, um, and so it is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Because he's, he's labeled this organization as a terrorist organization. He's been very clear. Um, so now we want him to be a little uh, broader or less clear. So that's, that's one. I, I do think that what we're on to, though, is that individuals get to a fork in the road in this region. And they will either go in a positive direction or they'll take a negative turn. And we do have some factors, whether you want to call them root causes, whether you want to call them paths to progress or paths to violence and extremism. There are choices. And how we help individuals frame those choices and shape those outcomes is part of what COMED and NDI and IRI and other organizations do. What I think we don't say enough is that our efforts are often diffuse and distributed in many directions. NGOs, foundations, institutes, bipartisan projects, government. We're all moving so quickly in different directions that at times don't you just wonder, can't we all get on the same page when we're helping a country or a region? Are we really united in a vision or are we so spread out over so many priorities, and I see head shaking because we all instinctively know how American that is. Let's get all of our cars filled with gas, turn them on, head out, get driving and get moving. We don't know where we're going in such a hurry. And it's what we all struggle with in government and out is can we just pause long enough to set a course? And right now, there is a fire burning. There is, Iraq called 911. They said this house is burning. So it is hard when you are a firefighter to pause and say, let's rethink the lone stars and the pillars. And let, we have a task at hand now, whether we like it or not. And we're going to have to deal with it while going down these other so I do want to hear from all of you because I think we have presented slightly different but overlapping visions and let's get some questions um, we know there are really smart people in this room so right. don't be shy There is no doubt there are many challenges throughout the region, but in my view, the first challenge is how do you create jobs? And to create jobs, you need talent, you need innovation, you need to have an attitude of being a venture capitalist. The region is basically a region of trading. Until we introduce this concept of having people bet on people with ideas, bet their capital on innovation, we're not going to create jobs. If you look at this country in the last 30 years, the jobs that were created were Microsoft, Google, you name it, Cisco. I don't see this in the region. 
know, this region has a lot of capital. I estimate the region has what, something like five trillion dollars right, the private capital, the official capital. But most of it goes into high deposits, real estate development, and hardly anything goes into creating new industries. And that's a challenge. Secondly, I think what the people in the region need, you know, people talk about democracy. Question on the, uh, What the region really wants, as Sheikh Zayed of Abu Dhabi used to say, we need to have justice, and we need to have, our people need to have fairness. That's what is really needed. Thank you. Um, i just say briefly on that. I, I think this is, on the, you're getting to something that is so core and not discussed much, which is the organization of government to deal with economic entrepreneurship, venture capital, jobs, employment issues. And I will tell you that at the State Department, one, I learned that yes, we have geographic bureaus and functional, but really geography often is the, the Trump part. We are very interested in what's happening in Egypt or Tunisia or Libya. And yes, we have a, an office for women's issues and economic statecraft, but we need to lift those functions up. And I do think there needs to be an e-agency of entrepreneurship and economic statecraft and education around vocation. Mm -hmm. And this is where you get into the, the really nuts and bolts of what who has power and who is thinking beyond their region, their country, and their state. So I, you know, I don't know how much you've thought about the same issue that transcends one country. Yeah, so just on that, and just also a broader point, um, so economic development, youth empowerment, entrepreneurship, all these things are critical, and that's where I think it's not just about governments, but also about um, civil society, people-to-people um, -people interaction and all of that. But that can't be a substitute for the kind of high-level policy. And I worry sometimes that we, we focus on the low-hanging fruit and say we have to do X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, it has to be part of a broader strategy and vision. And um, this is where I think when, when we wait too long and when we dither, as I think this, this administration has, then we get pushed into the position of firefighting. And I think it's really worth noting that the rise of extremism in general, and the rise of ISIS in particular, was not just predictable, but predicted. And there were many of us who were warning this administration as early as 2012, saying that the longer we wait to intervene in Syria, the longer we wait to take action, the extremists will benefit from that, from the power and political vacuum, and they'll gain ground, and the so-called moderates or mainstream, <coughs> whatever you want to call them, are going to be eclipsed. And, um, and time and time again, this was discussed and debated, to the extent that people like Robert Ford um, just couldn't even stand it anymore and had to resign, um, ultimately. so. Um, this, is, um, this is where I think having a proactive vision, um, that the decisiveness becomes really important. And there was actually a specific warning from, from, from some colleagues They actually made this argument very specifically that if we don't intervene militarily in Syria through targeted airstrikes against the Assad regime, along with a serious plan to boost mainstream rebels in 2012, then over, like then at a later point in the future, we would be forced to intervene. But then it would be even more, even messier. And that's precisely what's happening now. And that's where there aren't good policy options. We're here discussing this. I don't have. None of us have a really encouraging set of policy options because so much of the damage has already been done. We will never be able to undo the effects of the rise of ISIS. And that's a longer conversation, but once you remove the mental block, I mean, up until now, extremist groups were very careful about not announcing a caliphate because of the historical weight of what that meant. Al-Qaeda was very careful about not doing that. But ISIS, and that's why ISIS, I think, is so revolutionary, because they said, we're not just gonna talk about the caliphate, we're gonna do the caliphate. 
Um, and now we're going to have a situation where whenever we have a failure of governance or a piece of territory that's ungoverned, an extremist group is going to be thinking to itself, well, maybe we should just announce a kind of Islamic emirate here the way that ISIS did in Syria and Iraq. So even if we defeat or degrade ISIS now, I really fear that this is going to be a decades-long struggle. Um, especially since we're not really willing to, to address some of the root causes here. So in that sense, um, we're talking about a very messy 10 to 15 years that are coming. And I fear that it might actually get worse than it currently is. And we've been saying, I remember, we, you, know, you, talk to, you talk to people in the field of, of Middle East policy in February, March, April, and we say, oh wow, this is really bad. And we wonder how much worse it can get it keeps on getting worse. So let me ask just what, if you could talk about this, what do you think the US policy should be vis-a-vis -vis Assad while fighting ISIS should? Yeah, and then I will, after you give us the definitive thing we should be doing in Syria, <laughs> I'm going to tell you why we didn't do, do it. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, first. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so right now, so Hegel, as you guys, as you guys probably saw in the hearing the other day, Hegel said that we have the five hundred million dollars in aid, and that would go towards training and equipping five thousand fighters in Syria. Sorry, that's fine. That's a positive step. It's a step in the right direction, but it's a total mismatch between means and ends. You have more than a hundred thousand rebels from from across the political spectrum operating in Syria. And 5,000 fighters, and keep in mind, they wouldn't be trained for another year. I mean, this takes time to actually do that. So as even Hegel himself acknowledged, this is not going to be enough to turn the tide. And I was even more shocked. I honestly, uh, I was gasping. I, was, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing General Dempsey saying at the hearing. And John McCain, for all his faults, and you know, we might have serious issues with his approach to the Middle East, he was right to call out General Dempsey, and McCain was beside himself. General Dempsey said that these fighters would be trained to fight ISIS and not necessarily Assad. And to ask Syrian rebels to focus on ISIS when their primary concern, their primary enemy over the last three years has been the Assad regime, as McCain said, is a fundamental, reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of the motivations of the very people we're supposedly trying to help. If we don't even understand the motivations of the so-called local forces that are so critical to our fight on ISIS, then forget about it. Well, let me Why answer the, the hard question. Because <laughs> people ask me all the time, you were in the building, you were in the State Department for a year at those meetings with Robert Ford. Why didn't we train, equip, help, support, arm, moderate, Syrian moderate rebels. And you used the very sophisticated State Department word, messy. <laughs> messy is what has defined this whole Syrian struggle from the very beginning. Messy is not an excuse, it's an is. It's not a positive or a negative situation that you inherit, it's an is. And what is a Syrian moderate. First of all, if any of you have tried to pick out moderates in any crowd, a moderate doesn't have a t-shirt with an M or a white flag or a hand in the air that says me moderate. In fact, I know foreign policy people are not funny people. We don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> however, however, there is, for those who haven't seen it, a New Yorker cartoon an article out today, and it is an application if you would like to apply for assistance, if you are a Syrian moderate, fill out this application. I tweeted it much to the chagrin of many in the administration. It's at my at sun and shine Tara. I put it up there because it was so compelling to me that it's reality how do you know? I do think it is a mistake for administration officials to argue that it hasn't gotten harder to find them over three years. I think that's just a bad public diplomacy argument, but I do understand 
it was very hard to distinguish in this early Civil War uprising who from who. Yeah, if I could just, if I could just respond to that, because I think actually what's somewhat distinctive about the Syrian rebel theater is that we actually do know quite a lot about Syrian rebels. I mean, there's been endless amount of research from people who specialize on the intricacies and nuances between different Syrian rebel groups. But I would raise the broader question, why should we only, I actually have stopped using the word moderate. Um, I think we should just um, strike it. a moratorium on using the words moderate in relation to the Syrian rebels. And that raises a bigger question, why should we only support quote unquote moderates? That's why I prefer to use less extremist, non-extremist, mainstream rebels. Because let's be honest, the vast majority of opposition forces in Syria and actually the broad region are not nice, fluffy, liberal, pro-American, English-speaking, technologically savvy, Twitter using. I mean, we project so much. We want to see our own image. We, uh, we, we want to create an opposition in our own image. But the fact of the matter, when you're fighting and dying for a cause, you're naturally going to tend towards religion. And the vast majority of, of rebel groups are at least somewhat Islamically influenced. Um, they're Islamists to one degree or another. Even some of the FSA-aligned rebels are Islamically oriented. This is just the reality of the situation. And which is why we have to think more broadly beyond the nice secular moderates and also look at a broader coalition that includes Islamist rebel forces that are opposed to ISIS, and that can provide a counterweight to ISIS. I know that's not a popular thing here in D.C., and God, and God help me trying to get Republicans to even you know, accept the word Islamist, but um, I think that is the realistic way of looking at the Syrian rebel theater. And uh, we can talk about the constituent elements of the Islamic front, so Kurd Shem, Harakat Hazm, um, the, the MB affiliated shields. I mean, there's a whole array of groups that hate ISIS and see ISIS as a fundamental threat and are willing to work with their counterparts in the FSA to fight ISIS. But, sorry, yeah. but, but is that really uh, the alternative that the people would want? Is it because you get rid of one devil and mm -hmm. you, you fall into another one? Or, right. or but this is, this is why I think it was important to act in 2012 where the FSA rebels were actually the ones that had the momentum and now they're obviously weaker so you're right it is more challenging now that's the danger of waiting um, no, but I mean yeah. in terms of also the governance style yeah you know you had Morsi you had others who people started criticizing and saying but so a lot of these not. Islamist rebel forces have significant local support on the ground um, and they're primarily made up of Syrian forces. And that's where ISIS, I think, really stands alone in having, you know, a, a, a big element of foreign fighters. But if you look at most of the other rebel forces, they are actually rooted in their own societies. Yes, we have to be careful about who we arm and who we support. There has to be a vetting process. But we can't expect, um, but we can't, ex we just have to be realistic about, about the kind of the secular moderates who we like to think are more powerful than they actually are. And I'll just, just want one more thing on what we can actually do to kind of more directly answer Sarah's question is, it has to be higher than 5,000. We have to find a way to integrate the rebel forces that we're training into the, bro into the broader kind of um, rebel theater. So how do you integrate them? And McCain asked the same question. So we have these 5,000 or 7,000 or whatever it happens to be, then what? What do you do with them after that? And what do you do when Assad uses air power to attack FSA rebels? Are we going to let them get attacked by the Assad regime? This is why there can't just be, in my view, airstrikes against ISIS. We also have to consider the possibility or necessity of airstrikes against um, but the Assad, Assad regime and the, um, the military capabilities of the Assad regime. Um, that's more challenging, obviously, but that's where, if we're serious, I think that has to be part, part of the approach. I, mean, um, I think what we've seen, though, from the question raised, is we, we've, we've gone from the strategic, yes, we need uh, economic support, we need to create jobs, and then immediately gone to, right, what do we do tomorrow? 
Uh, yeah. Well, and you know, I would ask all of you to think about if you're a Syrian, firstly, how many Syrians are no longer in Syria? Anyone have, an, I'll give it to you, but the up-to-date figure on the number of Syrians who are not even in Syria today. Three million? Three million. Now, we toss numbers around. We are talking about three million people. And I keep saying, if you're in the field of building democracy or engagement or civil society, Eventually, talk about reintegration. These people will or will not return to Syria. And they will have formed views of the United States and the West, wherever they are, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Iraq. And so we now have a situation, and I, I do agree that the longer we waited, the harder, the more people on the move, the more people questioning who's right, who's wrong here. And you know, some, some days, and, and I know we're not allowed to point out people we miss, some days I really miss Fouad Ajami. Because Fouad Ajami sat on CNN night after night. Go back and look at the tapes, saying precisely what Shadi's saying, which is that over time, the groups become more diffuse liberated territories are no longer liberated territories by one side or the other. People cross borders that are porous now into Turkey and other places. So messy is messier. And I, I, I think that's a reality of what we're <coughs> dealing with. Let me ask this. Let's assume that the strategy put forward by the president works just fine and you're able to uh, defeat ISIS, uh, then you end up in Syria with the opposition wanting to fight Assad. What will the U.S. do then? Will they support them? Will they finally take action against Assad or let the opposition fight their fight on their own? You know, I, I think David Ignatius is another very smart person to read, along with the Tom Friedman piece. But David Ignatius said something that haunts me. He said, I'm haunted by the consequences of toppling an authoritarian regime without having in place the pillars that are going to support civilized life. And this is, again, head shaking, we're wrestling with. If you cut off the top of pyramids, what happens to the base? And as a former journalist, I will tell you that what I see is that we had elites at the top of places. At the top of a triangle is a pointy, elite, small tip. The bottom is a public that's large and the base, if you will. And what happened is the pyramids, the triangles got turned around. And suddenly the base was at the top and the elites were out. And it's tough decision making in a public square. It's really hard, and I see a yes, hand going have. up. It's hard yeah. to govern, yeah. asking everybody. Uh, let's hear, Hani Mastery is yes. a great program in Palestine for women and children there. <coughs> I don't think we have a long term policy in the Middle East. I think uh, we only have military policy. That every time there is a crisis, we have a crisis we have to solve. Problems in the Middle East are long term. We have to work on the new generation, and it will take years. Also, the leadership in the Middle East have not spent time and money and effort in terms of promoting education to their neighbors, in terms of alleviating uh, poverty, in terms of empowering women. These issues that the United States should have talked about, they only talk about Okay, we have a crisis. We don't put pressure on governments in the Middle East who are paralyzed to come and spend money on all these elements. This is the war that we should wage. And we'll take 20 years to create a new generation. We have total unemployment of youth, whether it is in Palestine, in Iraq, in Syria, in everywhere. Nobody is paying attention. We only pay attention is 
how we have been analyzing the present crisis. We don't look for the future. I'm going to tell you something. I started a, a, an organization for early childhood in uh, Palestine. Americans went there. They can take every one of you to refugee camps, and you will feel safe, because they ate with them. They came to help them. And I was amazed. They taught me lessons. They took me to refugee camps. And I was uh, very secure. And we win wars by being in the world and the Arab governments all over. And the rich Arabs and everybody should be in war, and we should put more effort into this. I want to um, just respond and, and close with this because I, I know we're running out of time, but on my note of hopefulness, the, the words early childhood remind me to remind you that people are not born a moderate, a radical, an extremist, a fanatic, a peace-loving, dove-carrying, there's a moment before all those influences and all those histories and rivalries come into play. There is a period of time with a new <coughs> young person. You get one shot at it sometimes, one opportunity before they're trapped like their fathers or mothers or grandfathers or whatever they hear were the historic rivalries. And I think we have to hold on to that. That is the potential of a new generation. But we're going to have to have patience. So I come full circle and full cycle to this impatient America. Exceptional, but impatient. If I could just um, add something and, and to, to your question as well. So, you know, as, as Tara has been emphasizing, this long-term component is critical, but it kind of raises the question. So I actually had an interesting discussion on Twitter the other day where it was emphasized this long-term component. And a colleague of mine said, but isn't the long run just an endless series of short runs? <laughs> and I think that our political structure has a lot of difficulty doing what we want it to do. And actually, you know, Tara, when you said there's someone that you miss, I got a little bit nervous and thought you'd mentioned Bush. But, uh, <laughs> but actually, Bush did get one thing I think right with the freedom agenda there was a war on terrorism but then there was the, the so-called freedom agenda it didn't last long but where I think Bush and the neoconservatives were willing to recognize the root causes of regional dysfunction and that's where democracy and governance um, were prioritized at least rhetorically so I think it is possible for us to think that way but I don't know if our governmental structure is oriented around that considering that the last five decades our policy has depended in the Middle East on autocratic regimes. So this is this is the way we look at the region. And I think that we're gonna have to think seriously about our relationship with the problematic allies like the Saudis. What is our long-term relationship with the Saudis? Because we don't share the same vision for the region. But if we don't, what does that mean in practice and how much are we willing to create some distance between us and them, for instance, I don't think we have clear answers on that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, then one final, the last question. Oh, one last one. comment, you know, I've been traveling in the region for 40 years. And wherever I go, when I see a taxi driver, I see a waiter in the restaurant. And I said, what is lacking? And the answer is dignity. And I said, what do you mean by dignity? And the answer was, I need a job. If I have a job, I have dignity. And that's what a region means. People will be, at the moment, when you're hungry, and you're telling them, well, democracy. Well, democracy is an alien concept. And yes, democracy is necessary. But right now, people want to eat. People want to have good housing. People want to have good medical care. And that's what people mean when they say, I want respect and dignity. First, they have to survive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.